Amen. I'm David Getches, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you here to the 36th annual Austin Scott W. Jr. Lecture. Professor Austin Scott, after whom this uh, lecture series is named, uh, was on this faculty for 20 years and was an expert in criminal law and procedure, beloved by students and revered by his colleagues. The lectureship is one of the school's great celebrations throughout the year. Its purpose is to honor one of our faculty members for his or her important scholarly work, sometimes, as tonight, a work in progress. Listed in your program are the prior year's Scott Lectures, and several of them are here this evening, and I'd like to ask the former Scott Lecturers who are with us today to stand. <clears throat> now, this year's Scott Lecturer is truly a Scott Lecturer, <laughs> Scott Peppett. Professor Peppett is a wonderful colleague whose work has earned him not only the esteem of those around him, but a reputation that's national in scope. Scott teaches contracts, legal negotiation, deals, and counseling family enterprises. Students flock to his classes, seek him out for his wisdom and counseling. Here at Colorado Law, Scott can be counted on to support his colleagues and to work prodigiously serving the school, as he recently did as chair of the Appointments Committee. In meetings, he can ease tense and difficult situations. His blood pressure seems to go down as others rise. He serves the larger community in a number of ways. One is as a board member of the Polycystic Kidney Foundation. Scott has published books and articles that have gotten wide attention. He was co-author of the well-known Beyond Winning, negotiation, uh, negotiating to create value in deals and disputes, which casts negotiation as a problem-solving task. This month, he has invited guest blogger on the respected legal topics blog, Concurring Opinions. He's written articles on topics at the intersection of ethics and contracts, and his current research and writing explores the role of legal, economic, and other information and incentives on contracting. In this context, he's concerned with privacy issues. A forthcoming article in Northwestern Law Review is entitled Unraveling Privacy, the Personal Prospectus, and the Threat of a Full Disclosure Future. In his lecture tonight, Augmented Reality and Freedom of Contract, Scott will discuss a current project that is on informational privacy. Now, we've all experienced the personal conflict of feeling exposed by the ease of information discovery by others, and yet seduced by our own curiosity. Even those who don't bear all on Facebook do wonder what is known and said about them, and wonder if it's somehow in the future, or maybe even the present, going to affect their good fortune. But we do relish the idea of being able to find out what the neighbor's house is worth on Zillow, or to roam the streets where a celebrity lives with images provided by Google Earth. Now you can hold up your droid and point at the area around you, and it'll tell you where the nearest pizza parlor is. And how cool is it to be able to point your iPhone at the walls of the Grand Canyon and get feedback on the geology of the structure? or maybe point it at the guy who comes up in the bar and find out if he's a drunk or a sexual predator. <laughs> Gary Steingart, in his 2010 book, Super Sad True Love Story, 
has satirized the future, a world created with apparati, handheld devices that take information gathering the next step in augmented reality. We can point and know things around anyone, like cholesterol and stress levels, their credit rankings, their net worth, self-esteem and relationship history, and know whether we want to hook up or do business with them. Is it that far off? Would we really benefit from this information? Would relationships or deals be better or worse? Tell us, Scott. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, I can honestly say I'm pretty sure that that's the first time that the dean of this law school, any dean of this law school, has ever spoken in front of a picture of the Terminator. <laughs> so um, I apologize that that continued to run. I was sitting there thinking, how do I turn it off from down here? Uh, thank you, David, for the uh, introduction and your kind um, uh, comments. Um, and obviously, thank you also for inviting me to do this. Uh, as you saw from the people who stood up uh, earlier, um, this is a, a real honor for me to get to present the Austin Scott Lecture. I do it in the footsteps of many of my colleagues. I've been here for 10 years and have been to, I think, all but one or maybe two uh, of these lectures in that time. Um, and so I'm somewhat humbled and extraordinarily anxious uh, that I not screw this up too badly. Um, I do want to say a couple words of thanks before we start, in addition uh, to thanking David. Um, one is to Chris Bell and Rex Head, who are floating around here somewhere making the technology work and have humored me as I've explored pushing the technology a little bit tonight. Um, and to Daniel Hayward, who I think is outside, but who has done all the logistics of setting this up and um, without whom this, this wouldn't happen. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all the people in the audience who are guests to the law school. Uh, I saw a bunch of people who are friends from Boulder, um, some of whom I invited, some of whom I think saw this in the newspaper, <laughs> uh, which makes me a little nervous. Um, uh, and also, uh, particularly to my parents, Russ and Sandy, who are here uh, from Connecticut, and thank you uh, very much for coming. Um, and then last, uh, I, I want to use my somewhat bully pulpit at the moment to just say that uh, uh, because I won't have another chance, probably, in front of a large audience. Um, if you didn't know this already, our esteemed dean uh, recently announced that he will be stepping down as our esteemed dean. And I just want to say uh, that it has been a complete pleasure uh, for the last seven years to get to work here in your law school, um, and that you have done an enormous amount to make my life here uh, a pleasant one and a productive one, and I am incredibly grateful for that. So um, thank you. Um, so, to start, uh, I, I should just admit that I have a bad habit, and that is any time I speak in public, I try to do way too much in way too little time. Um, and I am going to be in totally guilty of that um, tonight, because I think I have 126 slides to get through. Um, but don't worry, I'm really good with slides, I can do them really fast. So, um, some of my students know already that uh, I do two things while talking, I pace, so I'm mic'd up so that I, you can continue to hear me. Um, and the other thing is uh, I can end up talking a little too fast. I promise there'll be some time for questions at the end. Um, if you're completely lost and just mystified in the middle, uh, either just deal with it, or if you have to get a question in, in the middle, that's fine too. But I'm hoping that you won't be. Um, I'm going to try to do three things, which is why this is a little ambitious. I'm going to try to lay out just a quick explanation of what I'm talking about in the title of the talk when I say freedom of contract. There are some serious contract scholars in the room, and for you, I apologize, this is obvious review, but for, for the, for the, to set the stage, I want to lay out um, where the current debate in freedom of contract is. And then I want to talk about augmented reality. I don't know how many of you got to really watch the flipping slideshow uh, as it went by. Some of that I'll repeat, but I want to introduce you to what does this term mean, 
And as David said uh, in the introduction, there are many different ideas about where this is going, and I want to give you a few. That's kind of the gratuitous and fun part of this, um, because I get to just romp through a lot of technology, um, which will be fun to show you. Uh, and then obviously the last part is I'm trying to tie these two things together and give you a sense of why I think these changes in technology are going to matter. Um, to, to be transparent, this project is something that I started a couple of years ago when I was on uh, sabbatical. And in the luxury of sabbatical, you can think about you know, all sorts of things you normally wouldn't have the time to, to, to mull over and read stuff you normally wouldn't have the time to read. And I started getting very interested in how changes in information technology are changing markets. Because anytime you change markets, the law changes too. So the law um, has to respond, has to follow uh, the way markets are structured. And I got increasingly intrigued with that. Um, one of the pleas of the evening to the academics in the audience is that most thinking about technology and the law has been sort of sequestered. It's been done by um, intellectual property lawyers, so intellectual property scholars who have obvious reasons to be thinking about technology, and it's been done by privacy lawyers. Um, we're actually very good at both of those things uh, at this law school, and they're both really important, and I have no problem with both of them. In fact, as David mentioned, I've gotten interested in the privacy piece, but that's not what we're going to talk about tonight, um, either of those things really, because what I'm interested in is looking at how technology is changing contract law. And I think similarly you could do the same thing in constitutional law, and you can do the same thing in criminal law, and you can do the same thing in property law, and you can do the same thing in employment law, and start looking at the way the information architecture underlying our market um, or our world is going to change all those substantive areas of the law. So this is kind of a case study um, of that larger idea. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, freedom of contract. Um, what am I talking about with the idea of freedom of contract? Freedom of contract, I'm, I, I like graphics, so, and I have a lot of my first year contract students here, I should just say, so part of this is geared at a summary of the entire semester in 10 minutes for them. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but here's the basic idea when I say we're going to talk about freedom of contract. The world of contract law, as the quote on the left uh, screen uh, says, the world of contract law is premised, is founded, is, is, is rooted in the idea that competent human adults should have the freedom to order their private affairs as they want, up to certain limits, um, but that essentially the law should try to grant to them um, as much freedom to uh, negotiate and contract for things as it can. Uh, and that's the classical idea of freedom of contract that I'm representing here with this nice green circle. Um, and you know, this evolved in the, well, it evolved a long time ago, but it evolved uh, in our modern law in sort of the late 1800s in particular, people like Oliver Wendell Holmes and um, Professor Williston, great contracts folks who said, listen, this is the bedrock. It's the idea of consent. It's the idea of um, private ordering. It's the idea of freedom of contract. Okay, and that was a pretty uncontestable thing. Um, you know, everybody, that was okay, great. So you build the Western liberal, um, uh, sort of Western liberalism on that idea, or certainly it's a critical component of that idea. But we never said it was unfettered. We never thought it was limitless. Oh, wrong button. Um, we said, okay, there are a couple things that have to cabin that in a little bit. I mean, one is that there are certain things that you cannot buy and sell. So there's certain things that I'm going to call up here inalienables. You can call them other things as well. But for example, um, you can't buy and sell humans. Now, obviously, that first example shows you this is a somewhat malleable idea because not so long ago in this country, you could buy and sell humans. Um, and so when I said late 1800s, there's a reason for that. Um, but post the Civil War, uh, we realize uh, or finally come to agree that you can't uh, engage in the uh, commodification of humans. But there's lots of other things, right? So for a long time, actually from roughly the same period, you can't buy and sell um, sexual activity. 
You can't buy and sell organs currently under federal law. If you try to sell your kidney, you'll get arrested um, or uh, something bad. Someone, I don't know who the kidney police are, but they'll show up. Um, you know, you, you, it's, uh, you can't do that. There's a federal statute saying you can't, you can't do that. It's an inalienable thing. You can't sell your votes. You can't sell your children as much as sometimes people want to try. They can't sell their children. And they cannot, not only can't they sell their children, they can't sell rights to their children. So they can't trade away their custody rights for money by contract. I mean, now you're, some of you are sitting there saying, but I know someone who did that. Um, yes, they may have done it as part of an implicit negotiation in a divorce, but they didn't actually sell their custody rights. I can't go to Michael and say, do you want custody of my child here? You know, $10,000, you can have her. Uh, it doesn't work that way. I can't, I can't do that. So there's certain things that are inalienable. And then in addition to that set of constraints, we also have um, another set of constraints of those who are incapable. So we've always said there are certain classes, certain people who don't have the capacity to contract, whether it's um, a mental incapacity, they don't have the ability to understand the transaction that they're entering, or they're minors, they're children, and so we just say, well, you know, wipe them off the board before the age of majority. Um, if they enter into a contract, they can get back out of it uh, because we're worried that their consent isn't really legitimate or isn't serious enough or isn't um, understanding enough, uh, and therefore we say, okay, they're out too. Okay, but subject to those two zones, and don't let the size of the circles fool you. Really, the green circle is like the whole screen, and the red bit is really tiny, right? I mean, 99 out of 100 times we say, you can buy and sell that. You can buy and sell your piece of paper. You can buy and sell your car. You can buy and sell your house. You can buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell, except for these sort of things on the fringes where we get worried. Um, now, that zone has always been a little unclear, as I said, sort of that line isn't always clear, and there are things that move back and forth, um, or things that get pulled into the commodification world, into the freedom of contract world, where we start to say, well, maybe uh, we didn't think that you should, uh, you could sell organs, but maybe you can sell sperm or eggs, maybe you should be able to spell, sell stem cells and blood and um, I was recently reading an article about breast milk. I mean, there's all sorts of things. Are these commodifiable or not? Can you sell blood or can you not sell blood? And we have all sorts of funny arguments about this. Um, for example, you know, you can, uh, for a long time you couldn't sell either sperm or eggs, but you had to donate them. In fact, in most places in the country. You still have to donate them. You, can be pay you can't be paid for them. You can be paid for your services in providing them. So if you think about it, when you, when you see the bus that goes by, I, okay, everybody laugh. Um, when you see the, the funny part about that is it wasn't one of my students laughing. It was one of my colleagues. So that, um, when you see the bus go by with the ad for egg donation, $5,000, what's really funny about that is that it actually doesn't say sell your eggs. It says give me, give your eggs as a charitable act and then we'll give you $5,000 for the, your time. So it's this sort of funny, that's why it's in the middle, right? I mean, really you're selling the egg, um, but okay. Um, similarly, we've had all kinds of panic about what to do about surrogacy. Um, is that selling babies? You can't sell babies. And we've got judicial opinions, uh, the, you know, the baby M case most notably from New Jersey. You can't sell babies and they had a whole, you know, uh, fit about that. That's gotten uh, more regulated, more easy to do. We've sort of pulled that into the freedom of contract world with some constraints. Um, we've started to get a little tougher on minors so they, they can buy and sell things a little more easily and they can't get out of it quite so much. We've had to fight about what do we do about voluntary intoxication. If you're really drunk and you buy something, does it count? Um, so there's a bunch of things in this gray area. Okay, so that's kind of the world of, um, of inalienability. And so one fight, this is getting down to where the talk is gonna go. There are two fights we're gonna talk about tonight. One is the commodification, anti-commodification line. So, for example, we're going to talk at the end of the talk about prostitution. 
the gist of that fight in the freedom of contract world is an argument about where that line should be. Right? Should you or should you not commodify um, that, uh, well, you can describe it as either that service or that person. Um, and so that's kind of the first tension point over how much freedom of contract, how much, uh, how big is that green zone on the slide going to be? So now I want to give you another one. Okay? So just remember that first one. Here comes the second one. The other big fight in the contract world, um, and actually it's even a bigger fight than inalienability and what should be commodified and what shouldn't be commodified, is an argument over um, how best within this green zone to affect the idea of freedom of contract. So within the zone of things we assume you can transact about, and with people we assume are capable of transacting, um, A will sell X to B. There's your contract up in the corner. A will sell X to B. And in classical contract world, go back 100 years, we said, okay, as long as A and B are both competent adults, as long as X isn't on that list of bad things that you can't sell, A will sell X to B, great. Enforce it the way they wrote it down. They signed it, as I say to my contract students, they signed it, they bought it. Um, with very few exceptions, and we generally were reluctant 100 years ago to look too carefully into how fair or unfair is this. And then, as the century went on, we started to get nervous about what uh, Mel Eisenberg has called transactional incapacity. We weren't worried that the person was mentally incompetent or mentally insane or something, but we were worried that they didn't really understand the transaction they were entering. You know, they got a 22-page single-space thing that some lawyer had written on a standard form, nobody had ever really read it, right? And they're a consumer. You go to buy an iPod. Dana goes to buy an iPod, and she gets this booklet of terms, and she's never really looked at it. And she would understand it, but none of the rest of us would, right? And so we start looking at that and saying, what are we going to do with that? Because that just doesn't feel like we just want to enforce it as it's written, because they could have written all kinds of gobbledygook in that 22 pages that we really don't think is fair, and we should stop them from enforcing. And so the idea of transactional incapacity leads to the classical formalism of contract law, the classical idea just whatever they wrote down and signed, that's it. It leads away from that to what became known as realism in contract law, the idea that we should look at things a little more case by case, and that idea gets bigger. And now, again, I said, don't, don't argue with me about the size of the colored zones, okay? I don't know, Andrew Schwartz is going to pick on me, I don't know whether the, you know, realism is that big or not that big, or how much it took over, but there are different arguments, right, about what's the balance here between the cases where we will still say, the way you wrote it down, you're stuck with. And the cases where we'll say, well, no, you didn't really understand, right? Uh, Dana didn't really read it, or she really couldn't read it, or she didn't know how to read, or even if she had read it, it wasn't really fair, or if it, maybe it was kind of fair, but not really fair, or may, right? Though that world, and I'm being very, very short here, but that world of realism, sort of case-by-case -case analysis of contract. Now this is, in, for, for all the people who took contracts 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 10 years ago, um, this, you know, or 50 years ago, this was a big fight. It's still a big fight. Contracts lawyers are writing about, now they're, we, don't, we, we can't keep calling it formalism and realism, so now we call it neoformalism and neorealism, which is just a way of saying we haven't come up with a better word for it. We'll just put neo on the front. Um, but we're still arguing about this, and why? Because the economists in the world will look at this and say, look, business, sophisticated business transactors want to be able to write things down and have them enforced as written. Okay? It's really efficient if they can do that. They don't want judges to come along later and sort of rewrite things or reinterpret things. That's just not 
very happy for them. And there's been a whole neo-formalist argument about, uh, by people like Lisa Bernstein, who's at uh, Chicago, who went out and studied what a bunch of different, what business people do in a bunch of different contexts and said, see, look, what they do is create little trade associations that aren't subject to the public contract law and they use really formalist rules in those little trade associations. People uh, who, Jeff Miller at, uh, in New York recently wrote an, a, a pretty amazing paper where he compared New York contract law and California contract law and said, why do businesses always choose New York law as their contract law? Answer, it's really formalist, and California is sort of the exact opposite. Right? And he said, you never see a business contract choosing California law. Why is that? Because they want to be in this little classical zone up here. So the neoformalists have come up with really sophisticated arguments, most of which I don't really understand, about uh, the economics of being up there. At the same time that everybody else has been saying, yeah, but when you go by your iPod and you get the thing with the 23 terms, you shouldn't be subject to what it says exactly. Or when your employer forces you to sign an employment agreement with a really nasty arbitration provision in it, you shouldn't be subject to that. We shouldn't enforce as written. We should look case by case. Okay, so that is the second fight that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, where are we going to draw that line? Okay, so there's our two arguments. Um, everybody good? Here we go. Okay. Now, by the way, footnote, can you come up with other things to talk about when you talk about freedom of contract? Yes, but that's a lot, um, those two fights. Okay. Uh, my argument is going to be towards the end of the evening, in about 22 minutes, that all the augmented reality stuff I'm about to show you, that the pervasive nature of data in the modern world and the increasingly pervasive nature of data is going to change these two fights. It's not a normative argument. I'm not arguing this is a good thing or a bad thing. I just want to claim that it's going to happen or likely to happen. How is it going to change it? I don't like to save the punchline for the end. It's going to make it more plausible to enforce contracts as written more often without looking case by case at the fairness of things. How much more? I don't know. And it's going to make that sphere bigger. It's going to push on certain previously inalienable types of transactions particularly I'm going to use the example of prostitution, and make it more likely that we start to say more freedom of contract in things that were previously inalienable. That's the argument. Okay, step two. Uh, what am I talking about with augmented reality? So I'm going to do two things in the next 15 minutes in this tour of augmented reality. One is I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples, but I want to put the caveat out at the beginning, most of them are about delivery methods. So when you talk about augmented reality, I mean, to the, to the um, example you were using in your introduction, we're really seduced when we talk about technology by the way, the glitzy part, which is, ooh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's got bionic contact lenses. That's so cool, I wish I had those, right? We like to talk about the delivery vehicle as the technology. I don't really care about the delivery vehicle. So by the end, although I'm gonna show you a bunch of cool delivery methods, I'm gonna to get to the end of that and say, it doesn't really matter for my purposes, except it's sort of fun to show them to you because you probably haven't seen a lot of them before. What matters for my purposes in this section of the talk is also this second part, which is, the kinds of information you're going to have available to you in real time, in real space, all the time. Okay, so that's what we're going to do uh, next. So let me show you some examples. Augmented reality is the basic idea that you're mixing the real world and the data world. Now you can say this a lot of different ways, but um, the, this is the, probably the best definition, the classic definition. Um, where they laid out, uh, Milgram and Cascino laid out a spectrum and said, listen, you've got the real environment 
over here, you've got the virtual environment over here, and you start to put these things together. You will find some definitions that have to do with visual, you know, it's 3D overlays of data on LALA, but this is really more useful. It's just a continuum, and somewhere in here, where you mix enough data with enough of the real world, you're starting to talk about an augmented environment where it's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal experience of real space. It's an augmented experience of real space. So what do I mean? Oh, by the way, one caveat. If you've never seen this before, this is the 2010 Gartner Emerging Tech, Emerging Tech Hype Cycle chart. Um, they do this every year. So it's fun. They, they, put, they have this thing. So it says you have the technology trigger. Then you have the peak of inflated expectations. Then you have the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> then you have the slope of enlightenment as it comes back to life. And then you have actual productivity, right, where it becomes useful. So you can see some things you know, that are becoming useful, like speak re speech recognition, um, uh, very biometric authentication, various other kinds of ebook readers are coming down off their high right now. But they're, you know, they're going to be useful. Um, some things die completely, broadband over power lines. They've, they've just X that out. Uh, it's never coming back. Um, augmented reality is, is on the up climb here. It's, it's climbing the peak. Uh, and so I want to say that, you know, although this is kind of a groovy topic at the moment in November of 2010, because it's really been a huge topic in 2010 as a, as a whole, I, I actually, again, because I'm not so focused on the delivery method, um, this isn't so important. But I do want to say that, you know, I, I don't expect this is all going to happen next month. Um, some of what we're talking about is near future. Um, some of it is a little farther out than that. Uh, it doesn't much matter uh, for what I'm talking about. They say it's all five to ten years. Okay, so the first thing is, you've all done augmented reality before. It's the yellow line when you watch football. The best augmented reality example in the world how do you, I actually got incredibly curious about this. How, how do they do the magical yellow line where the, the people's feet run over the line and the line moves? It turns out it takes an entire 18-wheeler tractor trailer truck full of computers at every game to do the yellow line. They film the stadium before the game begins from every vantage point and digitize the image and sh teach the computers in the truck, that's what the field looks like empty. And that's the way they can then use that essentially as a green screen where they say, OK, take the little moving things on top of that green space and impose them on top of this digital yellow line. It's not easy to do. Um, but see, augmented reality. And this year and last year, this went bananas. You know, baseball, golf. Horseback, uh, the Olympics were the most amazing thing. If you watched the Olympics at all, it seemed like every event was augmented suddenly. You couldn't watch skiing anymore. You watched multiple images of people skiing. Um, it's all augmented. Um, this is, you know, I love this one. How do they get the flag in the pool? And then, you, you know, for a long time, I thought they actually had the flag in the pool. <laughs> and then I figured out, no, no, it's a digital flag in the pool. It's just they've made it look like it's underneath the water. Um, you know, okay, so you've all done this already uh, and not even realized it or not even noticed. Okay? Um, generation one. I hope people got to watch the first set of slides because I'm not going to put them all up here, but there's some cool ones. Um, and I'm gonna, I should also say, I've posted a little thing on my faculty webpage that has some links in it. It's a PDF with a bunch of links to really neat videos and websites about all of this. So if you're curious and want more information, you can go on there. And that way, I don't have to show you all the videos uh, tonight. Um, I didn't want it to get too geeky, um, although it's pretty geeky. OK, so generation one, this is the 1960s. Um, very early experimental work trying to create heads-up displays. This thing was called, this was at MIT, this was called the Sword of Damocles. It was, they thought it might fall on your head and kill you. Um, uh, by generation two, you're into backpacks. So these are early generation augmented reality backpacks. You can see, oh, you can see 
uh, this guy's got this crazy sort of thing on his head and, and it goes on. This is 1998, 99, 2002, 2006. You know, if you wanted to do GPS, cameras, uh, compass, gyroscope, internet connectivity, and computing power, that's how big it had to be in two, 1999, 2002. Um, this, as David said, is how it ha big it has to be now. Generation 3 happens in late 2009, when the first AR, really AR-capable smartphones become mass available. Um, first, not first generation iPhone, the iPhone 3 or whatever it was, um, and the Android that combine those things, internet, compass, GPS, gyroscope, enough processing power and a good quality camera. So you suddenly have in your pocket a device that is the equivalent of what three or four years ago took a backpack. It knows where it is. It knows where it's pointed. It knows that it's looking at something. It's connected to the internet all the time. And it has enough processing power and storage ca capacity to actually do something with all that data. Pretty neat. They sell millions of them. And they're going to sell billions of them, right? There isn't going to be a smartphone on the planet that doesn't have all those capabilities um, pretty quickly. So what? Well, you can do some cool things with your iPhone at the moment um, if you want to do augmented reality and just play around a little bit. Um, there's this great thing called Car Finder. This is very useful if you go to Denver Airport and you can't find your car. When you get out of the car, you press a button on your iPhone and it, sends a it puts up a digital mark. This is where my car is. Then you fly away and you come back a week later and you tell the iPhone, take me to my car, and it takes you to the digital mark. Right? Neat. This is Yelp. Yelp is a very popular augmented reality application on the iPhone. And this is somebody looking through the camera uh, of the iPhone, and it's overlaying on top of that a bunch of places to eat. So you can see, you know, go this way, go that way. There's all these places to eat, and Yelp ratings, which are um, uh, of somewhat, well, I, I don't love Yelp ratings. Um, this is Juneo. This is another one of these layered sort of apps where you can put different things. And you can see, um, this person's looking down a street in Paris, and they say, here's opening night. There's a play showing at 7, 9, 10, or it must be a movie, 1130. Um, there's pizza. Uh, Julie says, uh, after the movie, let's get some pizza. Right? This is all on, how convenient, um, <laughs> on Juneo. Here's Layer. Layer's a European app. It's actually not an application as much as a programming um, sort of infrastructure uh, that you can build applications on. But this is somebody pointing. Uh, I guess they're, I don't know where they are, I guess they're in Amsterdam, uh, and it's saying, oh, here, this is a cafe, and let me tell you a little bit about the cafe. Um, this is Layer that's showing all of the people tweeting around you, okay? Uh, Layer is also very good for games. This is a game called Conquer. Um, if you want, you can play against real people in real space using digital weapons. So, uh, so what, it, what it does is it says like, oh, he's playing and you're both, you're playing, so shoot him. And you shoot him and then he's dead in digital space. I don't, I haven't done this, but it sounds kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Um, let me give you some uh, live examples. Except it's not. It didn't. Chris? Oh, it did. It did. It came back. Um, so I want to give you some live examples just because I know it's a little gratuitous, but if you can't have a little fun in a lecture, why, what's the point? Um, this is scary. Now, if I was Steve Jobs, I could plug my phone in and I could just put... It turns out you're not allowed to do that, where you just plug it in and you show it on the PowerPoint projector. Only Steve Jobs can do that. <laughs> Who knew? So I said to Chris, I want to plug in my phone. and uh, Can't do that. I said, Chris, of course I can. Steve Jobs can do it. No. <laughs> I'm wrong. Oh, here we go. 
This is going to have to be the second best thing. Here's my iPhone. It's using an application called Bin Verified. See that little person? Those are sex offenders in Boulder. <laughs> you can laugh, but I wouldn't if I were one of them. Okay? It is showing me where they live. And if I put it in a different view, it will show me their picture, their address, what they were committed of, and when. and how far they are from where I'm standing right now. And how to get to their house if I really wanted to know. <laughs> if that weirds you out a little bit, remember, it's publicly available information. All Bin Verified has done is take the address in the publicly available database and put it on a map. Easy as can be. Um, this is a little more benign. This is called Peaks. It's really fun when you're standing on top of a mountain because it shows you all the other mountains and what they're called. So you can see I'm aiming that way. That's Haystack Mountain over there. Uh, through that wall, it's eight miles away, Haystack Mountain. It'll tell you how tall it is. So if you're standing at 12,000 feet and you do that, that's pretty cool. Not as scary as been verified. Let me show you another one. Um, I'm going to show you slides of this, but I'm going to try to see if I can prove that it works. Google Goggles. I'm in Google Goggles. I'm not going to, and I'm going to take a picture of this book. Interesting book. You are not a gadget. You may feel like a, <coughs> you may feel like a gadget, but you're not. Okay. I take a picture of the cover of the book. Click. It's doing a search. I'll try to get it to show you this. Okay, by the time I get it in front of the camera, Google has said, oh, that's You Are Not a Gadget by Jaron Lanier. And it'll also say instantly, would you like to buy it? <laughs> right? There it is. You can buy it. There's just a web page about it. It's visual search. Google Goggles has figured out that you can search by typing things in, but you might want to search by taking a picture of something. So let me give you some more examples of that. Let me try to give you some more examples of that. You take a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, it says, oh, that's the Golden Gate Bridge. This is, I'm not making this up. You can do this right now. You take a picture of a Frida Kahlo painting in a museum. It says, oh, that's a Frida Kahlo painting. Would you like to learn more about it? You take a picture of a bottle of wine. It says, oh, I know that bottle of wine. You can buy it somewhere else for $9.95, or you can buy it here for $12.95. You take a picture of a book. We just proved that one. You take a picture of someone's business card and it says, oh, I know what that is. That's an address. Do you want to add it to your contact list? You take a picture of a, of a brand. It says, oh, I know what that is. That's, that's Google. It's not reading the thing. It's, it's identifying the image by the colors and all of that. Oh, I know what that is. It says, that's Google. We can search on that. You take a picture of me. Not quite. So Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google recently said, no, no, we're not doing face recognition. It's just too creepy. He didn't say, we don't know how. It's pretty clear they do know how, um, because a lot of other people know how. Um, face.com, if you haven't explored face.com, it's sort of a fun one. Face.com has this thing where, because people post pictures on Facebook a lot, they want to be able to tag the pictures and say, this is my friend Susan. Face.com says, oh, we have a great service for you. We'll just do that automatically. You just show me your picture, and I'll just tell you who it is. Or actually, better yet, you show me your picture, and you tell me who it is. And I'll just keep the picture and who it is for good measure. <laughs> um, there are lots of companies 
very hard at work on cracking this little nut, and there, it's succeeding. This is an app called Converse Social AR, powered by Face.com. You point it at someone in the Face.com database, and it says, oh, I know who that is. That's Michael Kogan. Would you like to send him a message? Would you like to see his Facebook page? Would you like to send him some money? <laughs> I like that one. Would you like to send him some money? Sure. This, this is now. This isn't coming. This you can do right now. This was done in February 2010. This is Recognizer, created in Europe by a group called Astonishing Tribe, which was just bought by Apple. Okay? Ooh. <laughs> now, if you're going to see any videos on the PDF thing I mentioned on my website, this is the one you want to watch, because it'll just blow you away. It's much better in video, but what it does is, for people in the database, and it's obviously this is a trial run, and these are people who've consented to this. This is not just walking down the street snapping Whiting's picture. Um, it shows you an augmented reality view of that person. There's the real person. Here are her, the things she has chosen to display about herself as icons. And then you can click one of them and say, oh, here are her Picasso pictures, or here is her Facebook page. Or here's, this is also real. This is the same app. Here's his most recent tweet and her Facebook page. You can touch it and go directly to it. He's, he, he's, he's hoping lunch is at 12, and she says, yeah, I'm watching a presentation. Okay. Now, the point of all this is, this is generation three, but it's really generation like baby step, right? 2010 is the first year any of this has been commercially available. So this is where we are after not even trying, is the point. If this worries you, how many people does this worry a little? There are solutions. You can walk around the world like this. <laughs> there are people who do research into how do you trick the facial recognition devices. Turns out you have to have very creative makeup patterns. But hey, this could be really cool in 2025. I don't know, you know. You could start a new trend. Rex saw me putting the presentation up yesterday who handles some of our technology and was, I think, completely terrified. And then I put this slide up and he wasn't feeling much better. <laughs> Generation four. So that's all up to now. Generation four, obviously the holy grail is keep liberating this data from anything you have to actually pick up. So you don't have to have it you don't have to hold anything. It doesn't get in your way. Glasses. This is an actual heads-up display from the military created by a company called Microvision. Um, you're a soldier in an armored vehicle. This is what you're seeing. You see the road in front of you, but then you see data overlays on top of the road that say there's enemies over here, and there's a danger sign over here, and this is how fast you're going, and this is whatever. Whatever they want to put in the display. This is the direction you should be heading. Microvision is going to do the same thing to your car. There's going to, you're not going to have to have a little screen. They're just going to project it right on top of your, right into your um, windshield so that you don't have to actually look away. You just see it through the windshield. There's the road. There's the map. And of course, the holy grail for them is glasses and handsome models wearing handsome glasses. <laughs> This is their idea of what you're going to see when you look out of your glasses. You're going to see the real world, and on top of it, you're going to see your email messages. Or you're going to, if you're me making a presentation, you're going to see your notes, which would be really great, because I wouldn't have to be worrying about what's on a piece of paper. Um, you'd be seeing the presentation and what time it is, and you can imagine all sorts of things this would be useful for. This pair of glasses is the first pair of three-dimensional augmented reality glasses to go commercially available. It went for sale a month ago. You can get your very own pair, except that they're back ordered about 60 days and they cost $1,500. Um, what you see when you look through them is equivalent to standing in front of two 60-inch plasma televisions. Okay, so you are looking at the, you see the real world through the glasses, but you see overlaid on top of that the equivalent of two very large TVs. Nobody knows why we have these at the moment, except that a bunch of people want to play with them and figure out good things to do with them. 
This is Decomo's AR Walker. This was also announced about three weeks ago. Here's the thing. I started this project two years ago. I was trying to talk about this. The only person who would listen is Paul Ohm because he's just really nice. But everybody else just thought I was nuts, right? Because I'm talking about all this stuff and I don't know what. Well, I just, I, I just had to wait two years. 2010, it turns out, was the year that this all became real. This is Decomo's Walker, also a fun video to watch. That's all you need. See that little thing? It reverse projects back into your eye the image that they want you to see, you, and it's a map. It's a directional mapping system. Um, they're not selling it, but it works. I mean, it's functional, and they're just messing around with what they want to do with it at the moment. Um, another fun video, if you want to watch a video on that set of videos. This is a set of glasses from Lumos, not so pretty, um, but actually much more capable. So you get the idea. The other thing they're working on at the moment is how do you control these things without using your hands? So why don't we just put a camera in the glasses looking back at your eye, watch your eyeball, see what you look at, and that can be your input device. So you look to the left or you look to the right at something in that equivalent of a 60-inch plasma, and you see an icon and you blink at it or click it, and boom, you get the data you want. And this is probably the most interesting thing um, Pranav Mystery at MIT's Sixth Sense. If you haven't watched his TED talk about this, you should. Um, it's really fun. Uh, Pranav has invented a thing that's real simple. It's a smartphone in his pocket, a camera, a Pico projector uh, hanging from his neck, and some colorful markers on his fingers. He's going to get rid of those eventually, but at the moment the camera needs to know what it's looking at. With that, those three things, a smartphone, a, a Pico projector, and his camera, Let's say he wants to call up a map. He just stands in front of a wall. He projects the, from the Pico projector the map into the, onto the wall. And then with his fingers as the input devices, he can move it, shape it, move it, play with it. If you're thinking Tom Cruise in Minority Report, Pranov's way ahead of you. He wants to make a call. He just projects onto his hand and dials. It works. He picks up a book in a, a bookstore. You can't, it's too bad, you can't quite see it. You can sort of see it there. The system recognizes what the book is and then projects the Amazon five-star rating onto the cover of the book. <laughs> it can identify people. It's, got, it's a little clunky about this, but it's getting better. So I could, if I couldn't remember my students' names, which they know I never can, I could just... It would just be on there. I, wouldn't have, I just have to stop worrying about it. Generation 5, contact lenses, 1984. Schwarzenegger comes out with the Terminator. They're working on this. Um, Babak Parvis at the University of Washington can get one LED pixel to flick on and off in a contact lens that's actually wearable. One isn't so good. It's not as good as the Terminator. But where there's one, there's two. So you start to integrate all this stuff and you get real-time place, person, and object recognition. Will it be perfect? No, these are mock-ups. But you start to think about what happens if you hold up your device or your fancy glasses and you point it at someone. And you start to figure out who they are and what they're connected to and who their common friends are. You point it at a place and say, this is who lives here and this is who lives there. These are your friends in the area. Here's residents, of what they're saying about the street. This is news of this street. Here's the local favorite restaurant. Here's a bunch of people, what they've been tweeting about. Okay. So I told you that I was going to dazzle you with delivery methods and then say they weren't that important. The point of that little romp through the delivery methods is, whoa! Right? They're way farther along with some of this than I think most of us realize. Um, there are two sources of the data. One is what, in the privacy literature, we call the digital dossier. Um, uh, and the digital dossier is the idea that we've just been building massive digital repositories about each of you. Um, if you don't know this literature, you've been tracked. So you've been tracked. 
We know what you're buying at the grocery store. We know what your debt load is. We know what your credit score is. We know where you live. We know who you give money to uh, in politics. We know a lot about you. And you can pull all that information. Once I know that it's David Getches I'm looking at, I can layer data about David Getches onto the world. So I could stand at a street corner and I could say, you know, where are the sex offenders? There was a burglary here in September of 2010. There were four traffic accidents at this intersection over the last 10 years. Do you really want to buy a house on this street? Or you could say, here's who gave to McCain and here's who gave to Obama. Which houses do you want to knock on if you're, you know, Greenpeace? Or you could just say, here's 27 Farley Court, here's who lives there, here's how much he makes a year. He's a sex offender. You're a bank officer and you're interviewing someone for a loan. In the real world, in the normal world, you don't know anything about that person unless you go looking. But now we can just layer their credit score and lots of other data about them. They've been, they have a 10-year-old fraud conviction or they have some kind of incapacity alert score that's been glommed onto their data layer. My favorite cartoon about this can I buy you a drink? And she goes and scans the person, queries the database, finds out user rating, not so good. <laughs> Emotionally inaccessible, selfish in bed, womanizing, lying cheater, and she's gone. <laughs> right? This is the threat that people are going to know so much about us because they're going to pull the data from the, the cloud and we're not going to have any control over that. I'll give you another example from Prana Mystery that's less threatening, maybe. This is real life, he can actually do this. Do you want to buy Bounty, or do you want to buy 365 organic paper towels? Pranav walks into the grocery store, there he is. He's wearing his Sixth Sense device, he picks up the Bounty. The Sixth Sense device knows that it's Bounty, and it says, oh, it's a little hard to see, that's too bad. There are three circles, and it's got a yellow thing in the middle circle. It's flashing yellow at him, because Bounty uses too much bleach for his preferences. He picks up the other paper towels and it flashes green. And it, he can touch the green circle and it'll tell him why it's gotten that environmental rating as a set of paper towels. So you might say, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. I don't want people to know I'm a sex offender, but that's pretty good. <laughs> the other source of information is what I've called the personal perspective. Um, it's the idea that in addition to pulling information from the cloud about people against their will, people are going to push information to each other on purpose. Why would you do that? Well, the most benign example is, where are my kids? Right? All I've got to do is put some little device on them and I'll know where they are in real time all the time. Um, if Anna was that far away, she's this big, I'd be really worried. But let's say you're in a bar, and you're thinking, well, I don't, know, I don't know who to talk to. Well, one way to do it is, you know, <laughs> she looks interesting, she meets my criteria, and she's pushing data out into the bar saying, I'm single and I'm employed. And oh, by the way, she could be, it could be smart enough that she'd only push the data through Match.com if Match.com matched us. Right? We could both have criteria that said, don't tell me about anyone I'm not interested in. And she could have criteria that said, don't tell anyone who I'm not interested in. Right? How far do you want to go? <laughs> or you could make it more interesting, right? You could have options. Are you here for fun or are you here for work? And if you're here for fun, we could simplify things. We can have, if we have credit scores, why not have Match.com scores, right? How interesting would this person be, according to your criteria? And there'd be a reason why people would push this data to each other, right? Make life very efficient. And then you'll mix some things. <laughs> she might be pushing that she has the flu, so you stay away from her. And he might, we might be pulling data that says he's a safety risk. Okay. So as a concluding, some concluding thoughts on this middle part, 
And then we've got to go to implications. Um, there are lots of delivery methods. I have no idea which ones will win, and I don't care. I don't know if it's going to be glasses or things you hold up, iPad-esque, um, or smartphones or contact lenses, but it doesn't make any difference. The, the reality is data is available and it's coming um, and it's here and we're finding ways to bring it to you in real time in real space. There are lots of information sources. They're just massive, massive, massive. We could talk about that all night. Um, or you can take Paul's class. And the bottom line is lots more information is going to be available, available about people, places, things. And the last one I haven't talked about yet, but I'm going to in a second, is contract terms. People, places, things, which is really a subset of things, but uh, in real time. Okay, so last but not least. Um, so what? So how do these two things have anything to do with each other? Um, as David said, this is a work in progress, but I'll try to convince you of this. So I said there are two pressure points. There are two places where this fight happens over how much freedom of contract are we going to have. Um, one is uh, inalienables and the other is formalism and realism. So let's start with the inalienables and I'm going to just talk really briefly about prostitution. Um, this is obviously a sensitive topic. People have very strongly felt um, and strongly argued uh, reasons on one side or the other of the legalizing um, prostitution uh, debate. Um, this is a fascinating photograph for me. This is, a or this is a protest in California a few years ago to decriminalize prostitution. Notice the other sign, though. Bad girls like good contracts. It's really, I mean, you just can't ask for better if you're putting this speech together. On the one hand, you have the um, worldwide movement to decriminalize prostitution, um, which if you haven't been paying attention, uh, over the last 10 to 20 years has gathered steam um, in an unbelievable fashion. Um, there are lots of reasons why people argue to decriminalize prostitution, including uh, health reasons and other crime reasons and other reasons. Um, but the most uh, uh, grounded or sort of most widespread theoretical argument has to do with freedom of contract. Um, prostitution has been relabeled. Um, I'm not going to argue this is a good thing or a bad thing, it, but it's a reality. It's been relabeled as sex work, um, and the argument has now become this is a type of work, uh, like any other type of work, and it should be recognized as such. And in fact, um, there have been human rights advocates uh, who have argued that denying the ability to prostitute yourselves is denying human rights. In other words, that criminalizing prostitution is a human rights violation because you're denying free access to choose work as you wish. Now, you may feel like that's a little far out on a limb, um, but that is the state of the argument over prostitution at the moment. And since the 1970s, prostitution has become a massively globalized and industrialized segment of the economy. There are countries in the world where prostitution is 10% of GDP. Um, this is the dominant discourse on prostitution at the, and both feminist critics of prostitution um, and um, all advocates for prostitution pretty much agree at this point. This discourse about contract and freedom of contract and prostitution has taken over the discussion of whether to legalize or not um, prostitution. Uh, the arguments against prostitution are obviously intense. Um, they go to uh, all sorts of things, but um, primarily harm to the prostitute, or the, in most cases, the woman involved, all sorts of harm, physical harm, uh, violent crime, uh, medical ha health harm, um, psychological harm, uh, as well as more philosophical harm to uh, identity and autonomy. Um, they go to harm to the buyer or purchaser, Although that's much less talked about. It is beginning to be talked about. Um, they go to harm to society, externalities. The idea that um, the, one of the main reasons to limit prostitution is that those harms spread to the rest of us. Um, and I could go into that at great length, but I'm not going to. So this is the, uh, oops, this is the argument. Um, 
As Melissa Farley wrote, there's no way to make prostitution a little bit better any more than it is possible to make slavery a little bit better. There are strong views on both sides. Um, but the decriminalization movement is winning. Um, a huge number of countries have decriminalized prostitution in the last 10 years, including some that may surprise you. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, England, France, Germany, Canada, uh, Brazil, almost all of South America. Um, it's not just Nevada anymore. Um, the only, you know, Western industrialized country where it's illegal at the moment is the United States. That's not quite true. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's pretty close. Now, the argument when it comes down to freedom of contract is typically between those who try to draw distinctions between good prostitution and bad prostitution and those who say it's all bad. Um, the, those who want to draw distinctions use cases like these. So uh, obviously Ashley Dupre and Elliot Spitzer, I, for a while I had this slide with just Ashley Dupre and I realized why isn't Elliot Spitzer on the slide? Uh, uh, in any case, uh, you know, this is the uh, the infamous case that he's paying multiple thousands of dollars uh, a day or a night um, uh, to the agency that Ashley Dupre worked for. Um, Natalie Dillon, I don't know how many of you know Natalie Dillon, probably the most famous prostitution argument case in the last year. Um, Natalie Dillon tried to auction her virginity uh, through a Nevada brothel. She received a bid of $3.7 million. Um, she is a women's studies student at the University of California, San Diego, um, 22 years old, uh, and was thrilled at the th prospect of the $3.7 million. Um, she didn't get it. The buyer's wife objected. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Um, she, she is uh, still auctioning her virginity, although the initial furor that, 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 that led the bidding up that high died away um, once people thought it was over. In any case, people who try to argue for legalization argue these people can consent. These people are educated, highly paid um, sex workers who have the ability and should have the ability to consent. Now, my argument is, oh, I'll come to that in a second, my argument is um, that all of this information is going to change this argument. Because in the augmented economy, in the augmented world, you suddenly can have huge amounts of information about people, places, and things. So people. You can have an enormous amount of digital information layered on a transaction that was previously dark. A person went to a prostitute. They knew nothing about the prostitute. They didn't know her education level, her financial background, her medical condition, anything about her drug history, her criminal history. There was no way to know any of that. And therefore, when we've legalized prostitution in most places in the world that they've done it, they've tried to control all that. They screen the prostitutes. They put them in brothels. They do all sorts of things. The reality is, in an augmented world, all that data is available anytime you want it. And she can be pushing it into the world as needed or as the government requires to get the right to uh, engage in this activity. Um, I hate to say this because it's going to sound crass. But the, the, the economic information problem in prostitution from the point of view of the buyer is the quality of the services. The reality is, right, how is the, let's say, man supposed to know what he's getting? We've solved that using technology. Um, this is a site called the Erotic Review where men rate escorts. Um, you can go on, it's, I, did, I pulled this off this afternoon. You can, uh, actually this is from Google Images. Um, from 2009, but you could have gone and done this. Um, by the way, David, if you search my computer at some point, um, this, it really is for an academic purpose. Um, men rate escorts. What do they talk about? They talk about the quality of the services provided. In case you think that the information architecture is shifting just to the benefit of the men, and I'm saying men, it's not all men, but it's 99, not 99, 92% as far as we know, men um, purchasing sexual services from women globally. The women are, or the prostitutes or the sex workers aren't 
far behind. This is a deadbeat registry. Men who don't pay or are violent. I didn't find this until today. Escorts can post reports by state. There are currently 3,880 postings for Colorado. And here they are. On 11-4-10, some, an escort posted that some offender named Roger did something he wasn't supposed to do. Okay? So the argument is that information architecture is changing underneath us. And it's changing the terms of most of these kinds of debates. Um, it will be possible for a prostitute to know who they're dealing with, their medical history of the person that they're dealing with, the criminal background of the person that they're dealing with, lots, the education level of the person that they're dealing with, if we either regulate it to require them to know that, or it becomes economically rational for the person to share that information. And that changes the argument. Because even in the most stringent um, sort of uh, literature at the moment, on a, uh, arguing to abolish prostitution, one of the strongest arguments is no rational person would engage in, autonomous, in anonymous sex. Who would do that? It, can't be, it would only be the most vulnerable and desperate who would put themselves in the situation where they're in an intimate a uh, sexual encounter with someone they know nothing about and have no recourse against. Well, if you add enough data to the transaction, that changes. Um, similarly, by the way, the externalities, the social harms of prostitution are changing as well. The reality in the United States is it's really not illegal to be a prostitute as long as you're an escort. It's illegal to be a streetwalker. Um, what we've essentially done is said, look, if you, I mean, it's illegal, but it's not enforced. Anyone who plies this trade over the internet, we basically leave alone. Why? Because we don't have the social harm that we have in street walking, which is, you don't see it. It's disappeared. And imagine my bar example, where instead of clicking match.com or linkedin.com or Facebook for your filter, you just turn on a filter that says, I'm interested or I'm offering. It's now completely invisible to anyone who doesn't want to see it. The argument for social harm from this kind of activity begins to plummet as the data system changes. Um, similarly, I want to give you a couple other quick examples, then we'll stop so people can go have a drink. Consumer transactions, another area where, as I said, so this is the second argument, right? So that's the first argument. Here's the second argument. We're going to get more formalistic about things. I'm going to do this one really fast because I'm a little over my time. Right now, if you go on uh, websites, you can find out, so you want to buy a car, you can find out all kinds of information about the car. Uh, how good is its warranty? How does it compare to other warranties? You can get US News scores. What's their performance score? They're da, 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 da. Well, let's say you want to buy this car from this nice looking gentleman. <laughs> right? You could just have your choice of which thing do I want to be looking at. Right? There's the US News scores. Bam, I can see what kind of a car I'm dealing with. And more than that, you could have scores about him. Because places like Angie's List score service providers. So we could not only know something about the car, we could know something about the salesman. In this case, he's gotten a super service award. They say, oh, I can believe him. But you can take that to farther levels if you're a contracts professor, for example. The law of fraud requires that you prove not only that it was a misrepresentation, but that there was some sort of reasonable reliance on the representation. What if my digital display says to me, this person was convicted three times in the last 20 years for fraud. Is it reasonable to rely on that person anymore? This is the Williams v. Walker Thomas uh, furniture store case from contracts much loved in my class. This is the actual store in Washington, D.C. from the 1960s. This is a case of unconscionability where the court said um, that a contract clause which said that wasn't fair um, and essentially struck down the contract on the grounds that Mrs. Ora Lee Williams couldn't possibly have understood what this meant because no one could possibly understand what this phrase means, including anyone in this room. And uh, therefore, um, we should get rid of this and not enforce it. But what if she had known an awful lot about that store? like that it was constantly repoing furniture from people using that nasty clause. 
evidence that actually we know she probably did know in the real case, but um, the court didn't know she knew. And what if they had known uh, who she was? Would that change the way we thought about the transaction? Um, similarly, in employment agreements, the big fight in the formalism versus realism uh, debate in the employment arena has, in the last 20 years has been over arbitration provisions. And they're just impossible to understand for most employees. But what if instead of seeing this when you looked at a contract, you saw that? That's an AR marker, the little funny black box at the bottom. And if you were wearing your fancy glasses or you pointed your computer or your cell phone at that piece of paper, at that contract, instead of seeing that funny black mark, you would see that. And if you selected it, you could watch a video about what is an arbitration clause and why is it in my employment contract? What happens to the argument about the unconscionability of arbitration clauses, which is largely centered around no one could possibly understand one of these things, when the contract itself becomes augmented with rich data? Or a non-compete provision, another thing we tend to strike down on similar grounds, occasionally at least. What if it had an augmented ability with a little map that said, here's how this non-compete is going to work? What happens to contract doctrine in those situations? In my view, you start to say, enforce them more often. More light, most likely, um, I believe you will see a resurgence of this kind of formalism um, as people say, now I believe that these people have actually consented to this because they just should have watched the video. And on that happy note, um, if you want more information about this, uh, feel free to see uh, the little document I posted this morning on the web page. Um, I apologize for going slightly over, uh, and thank you very much. Let's go for about 10 minutes. Okay, should I just call people? to take some questions and uh, I will let them uh, let him field them from you. Fire. I know there's the, the prospect of beer so the, you know or whatever's out there. Juice. Yeah, Andy. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a whole sort of literature subworld on what do we do about those privacy policies? Are they enforceable? Are they not enforceable? Um, do they mean anything? Are they following them? Are they contracts? What are these things? Um, uh, for more information, take Paul's class. Um, but more than that, um, wait, <laughs> because we're still trying to figure out the answer. Uh, there's also huge differences in regulatory style, for example, between the United States and the EU over what do we do with this kind of privacy uh, and data. So there's a lot going on at the moment about trying to figure out how to handle that. Uh, yeah, Amit. It's an it's a interesting question. Um, I think there's at least a couple ways to talk about it, uh, and I'll try to do it briefly. Um, one way is that 
go back to the prostitution example, for example. It's very sanitized for me to stand here and say, look, more information is going to push towards legalization as um, you begin to have more information and it changes that market. But of course, you can then start to ask questions, and, and almost anybody would, including me, about, uh, yes, but it doesn't change the reality of why this person is in this circumstance, et cetera, just to provide more information. Um, so there's a whole you know, sub-layer, obviously, of um, power-based uh, factors that go into that debate. And those aren't going to change exactly just because you have more information. What's going to change, I think, in that debate, for example, is suddenly uh, the autonomy side of the argument, the people arguing this is all just sex work and we should permit it, have a whole new set of ammunition, which is we've alleviated some of the terrible working condition by providing more data to both sides of this transaction. Um, that's one way I would put it. The other way I would put it is information is not free. So what information is going to get provided? What data is going to be in your little fancy glasses? And who's going to have the fancy glasses? Right? Those are all also very political and difficult questions. Because you're not going to have an endless amount of data. You're going to have data that someone found it economically useful to collect, aggregate, analyze, push or pull, um, sort in real time. There's a lot of cost to doing all of this. And they're only going to, credit scores only exist because someone finds it hugely economically powerful for them to, you, to, to create them. Um, similarly, Match.com might find it quite valuable to be able to match you up with someone in a bar because they're going to take a little price from you as they do it. But there's a lot of difficult questions about the political economy of the information itself. It's not going to be neutral, let me put it that way. Um, but beyond that, I think we'll have to talk about this elsewhere. Yeah, Anthony. I don't even have fancy glasses on. And I knew it was Anthony. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. It already is. You can see through a house and realize that they're growing marijuana. The Supreme Court's already had to deal with this. That's augmented reality. It's using a technology to see the world in a way that your normal vision could not see it 25 years ago. So, of course it's going to have effects. If a, if a police officer is wearing fancy glasses and is driving down the street, look, the city of Boulder just bought a car, it just bought the car that can drive at normal speed and read license plates of parked cars as it goes. So that if it goes past a car that's behind on tickets, it just backs up and says, whoops, put the boot on that car. Okay. Is it going to have an effect on criminal law? It, yeah, I mean, without a doubt. You're walking down the street and the police officer knows who the criminals are. There's a company, I was telling my parents this at lunch today, there's a company that creates optical scanners, retinal scanners. Turns out they can scan your retina while you're moving at 20 feet. Okay, so if you think that you have to put your eyeball up to something, you don't. They can hit you at 20 feet while you're walking and figure, and everybody's retina is different. So if they have a big enough database of retinal images, they know that it's Dana Matthews. They're putting these as a test case in a city in Mexico with a million five hundred thousand people. They're going to saturate the city. These things cost about a hundred to two hundred dollars a piece. They're going to put them in everything: stores, malls, ATMs, everything. You want money out of your ATM? You don't need your card. You just walk up. Whoop, oh yeah, it's Dana. Okay, here's your money. Right. You go to buy lunch, you don't need your credit card. It's just the vendor already knows who you are and that you're sitting in his restaurant. And when they said, how are we going to do this? They're going to require all the convicted criminals to be scanned first. Okay? Then they're going to make it voluntary for everybody else. And the CEO of the company's strategy, which he announced in an interview that I was reading, says, the person says, the interview says, so, do you think anybody's going to actually volunteer for this? And he says, yeah, it's going to be so convenient that anybody with you know, good habits, good information, 
Of course they're going to volunteer. And then he says, and the reality is, once we get a critical mass, everybody will volunteer. Because if you don't, it'll be worse for you. If you're dark, if you're not in the system, we're not going to let you into our mall. Because we don't know who you are. And somebody I was talking to about this said to me, that'll never happen in the United States. I said, you want to bet? Wait until Al-Qaeda blows up the first shopping center and tell me that you don't have, if this technology is possible, the exact same thing in the United States within two years. I guarantee that you'll have it. Because it's possible, and people will want it. And they will say, I want to take my kids to the optical mall, not to the non-optical mall. Some people. Yeah. One more question, then we're going to have to stop. Why, 